Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our number six, the Provost Lecture Series. And as you can see, um, uh, so the, the Provost Lecture Series launched uh, uh, in October uh, 2022. And we have gone through uh, uh, five faculty members who either recently retired or recently got promoted. And it's with my great pleasure to open up today's Provost Lecture Series. will be presented by Professor Simone Pigalotti, who's recently promoted to full professor. And uh, so again, I want to thank uh, uh, many people shown on the slide, and in particular also, uh, to people from the provost office. And so we have been using this as our provost office uh, almost monthly event. And just so everybody is very happy uh, to see what uh, the OIS professors are doing and uh, uh, reconfirm our commitment to support um, excellent research within OIST. And also many other divisions shown here, they have uh, been very supportive, either in the budget setting or from the CPR communication and posting events and also recording um, every lecture to be potentially posted online. Um, so I'm just going to uh, keep my introduction very short. And so for today, Simone's lecture, um, um, Professor Izumi Fukunaga will be introducing Simone. And in addition, Izumi will be giving her own Provost Lecture Series in April. So this is also a means to, to promote uh, Izumi's uh, Provost Lecture Series, which will be uh, introduced by Simone. So that's perfect. <laughs> And so, so Izumi, now the floor is yours. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce my great friend and colleague, uh, Professor Simone Pigolotti, on um, this very special occasion of him being promoted to the full professor um, at OIST. Um, so Simone grew up in Rome, uh, where as a child he already had a great propensity to excel. And later he studied physics, in particular statistical mechanics. And after an extensive international training, um, he joined OIST in 2017 to lead the biological complexity unit. And over the years, uh, many of us have had the great pleasure to get to know all of the family members who also themselves have become really integral parts of our community. Um, so from the start, um, Simone took active roles to serve OIST, uh, for example, as a member of the faculty council, um, representing the colleagues, us, um, with his fresh and innovative ideas, and also by serving on recruitment committees, which takes a lot of time, um, that brought excellent new colleagues um, to OIST. Um, Simone also contributed really enormously to the intellectual environment of OIST and these are just two examples of events that he organized and uh, looking at these I really appreciate, appreciate that he puts in time and energy to bring world-class science to our campus. And Simone is also someone who has a knack for turning opportunities into success and uh, um, yeah, just a few years after this 2018 meeting where uh, Professor Luca Pelitti was one of the invited speakers, we saw publication of this really beautiful textbook titled Stochastic Thermodynamics. And Luca on this occasion has sent me a message to share with you, uh, which explains the background to this project. He says, I found a kindred mind in Simone both in his interest in stochastic thermodynamics and in the attempt to make use of statistical physics to understand evolutionary processes. So I took advantage of his invitation to OIST a few years, a few years back to suggest working together on a comprehensive introduction to stochastic thermodynamics. The collaboration, although carried out most, mostly remotely, was as challenging as it was pleasant. 
So I am very happy that his talent has been recognized by this well-deserved promotion. And in the book, uh, in, in, in the, especially in the introductory chapter, Simone and Luca explain that stochastic thermodynamics is a study of non-equilibrium or non-static properties of physical systems that span from microscopic to macroscopic scales. So to me, Simone's research creates new ways of, of thinking about the world that we live in, which certainly is not static. And as a result of this unique ability to analyze the complex world, Simone has been in high demand by colleagues both globally and also here on campus, as you can see from these diverse collaborations that studied everything from how genetic materials re replicate within bacteria, or how microorganisms multiply when there is a spatial constraint, and to grander things like how things spread in the ocean. Now, what makes Simone so successful in collab collaborating with the others? Well, Professor Amy Shen um, has shared with me that Simone's ability to abstract many world problems has enabled him to quickly find biophysical models to explain experimental observations. And Amy also noted that his open-minded approach and frank discussions have been very key ingredients uh, in the success of their collaboration. And I'm sure we will get to hear more about the secrets of his success and his fascinating research from uh, Simone himself. And uh, I'd like to end my introduction with a haiku I wrote on this occasion, <laughs> which is also etched on, on the gift plaque that will be presented later. And it goes like this. That language of chance put to our dynamic world surprise everywhere. I look forward to your talk. Thank you. So first of all, thanks Izumi for the very nice introduction and thanks to Amy and the Provost Office for um, organizing uh, uh, this uh, lecture series. So I have to confess that I, I'm not really good at preparing and presenting this kind of seminars. So in the last few weeks after I was invited, I've been thinking a lot about what should I tell you about today? So uh, one obvious choice would have been to just list uh, all the research achievements in these last few years at OIST, or maybe I should tell you about the story of my life, um, or maybe I can make some story about anecdotes of how, in what moment uh, I th thought about the idea that helped me solve some particular scientific problem. And then I started thinking more about uh, what do you m might be interested in hearing from me today. And uh, I thought that, uh, I realized that even people that know me relatively well at all, sometimes when they feel particularly brave, they end up asking, okay, but what is it that you actually do? So this is, I think, a bit of an overarching question. So I hope, I'll talk about most of these things, but uh, I hope that by the end of my lecture, you get a better sense of what we do in our unit. So uh, I'd like to start my story in 2017. This is the year when I, uh, we arrived at OIST. OIST at the time looked pretty much like this. There was no lab four, no lab five, was a little bit smaller. And uh, I was attracted by this place because uh, of the research that we do, that bridges between physics and biology. And so I was really into the interdisciplinary aspiration of OIST. And, uh, and that has worked very well for us. So we established nice collaboration and fruitful collaboration with a number of people from different uh, disciplines, from biochemistry to ecology to physics uh, and life science. So this has worked very well. Uh, so if I fast forward to winter 2021-2022, things were going uh, pretty well. There was still, we were in the middle of COVID by then, so you can see them wearing a mask outdoor. But overall, uh, um, our family was happy, science was working great, so things were pretty nice. Except that at that specific time, I started receiving the first uh, emails from the faculty affairs office saying that maybe it will start to be about time that I should think about preparing my tenure package. 
So, um, so that was a bit of a concern, and in particular, I started thinking, how should I uh, package together all these projects that we have done, where we have mostly followed our scientific curiosity, into some kind of coherent story? So I ended up uh, with a scheme. I thought that uh, thinking about three areas is good. Three is, they say, it's the perfect number. Uh, but this really represents pretty much everything that we do. So uh, we work in uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. We are interested in uh, small-scale biology, and in particular, how cells process information. And at the large scale, uh, we uh, look into population dynamics. So what I ended up doing for the review is just uh, look at all the projects we did in uh, um, during these years and just make them fit into this scheme as a classification to just give them some structure. So I don't want to do this uh, today because I don't want to bore you as I did with my reviewers. And I will instead try to make, uh, talk more about uh, why uh, these themes make sense together and what are the commonalities within these areas and use uh, a few individual projects as uh, key examples. OK, so I start uh, from physics, just for convenience. And I apologize if this is very elementary for some of you, but it's a general lecture, so I want to, all of us to be on the same page. So in a nutshell, the idea of physics is an uh, intrinsically reductionist science. So we believe that uh, we should be able, at least in principle, to understand the properties of matter from its constitutive elements. And this is precisely the goal of um, statistical physics. So the idea if we have, uh, uh, let's say, water, uh, we should be able to understand properties of water from the properties of, say, the water molecule. So making this jump is essentially the problem of statistical physics. And uh, I will not review everything in statistical physics, but I just want to give you a few messages. One is that uh, we became pretty good at doing this when the system that we are studying is a thermodynamic equilibrium. So the idea of a system of thermodynamic equilibrium is a system whose properties will not, do not change in time and is not crossed by any flow of matter, currents, heat, and so on. Uh, this problem was essentially cracked at the end of the 19th century uh, by the work of uh, Maxwell, Boltzmann, and a number of other people, Gibbs, for example. And for example, one key result in uh, equilibrium statistical physics is the so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that dictates that if I look at the, all the possible configurations of a large system, the probability of finding uh, the system in one of these uh, configurations is given by this expression. Uh, so E of x is, will be the energy associated with that uh, specific configuration. K is a constant, the Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature. So again, if you don't like formulas, basically the idea is that if you have a system at low temperature, uh, I would uh, find the system with high probability in states of low energy and uh, with low probability in states of high energy. And if temperature is high, this uh, probability distribution is much more homogeneous. So you can think of uh, equilibrium statistical physics as this battle between energy differences and temperature. Energy differences tend to make the system more organized and more structured. And temperature is essentially acts as a noise that makes everything much more random and uncertain. The other thing I want to stress here is the idea of universality, uh, which is a key idea in statistical physics. So it is pretty remarkable that this result is valid for a very large class of systems. I don't need to know what my system is made of. I don't need to know whether it's a liquid or a gas or a solid. This result will be always valid under very weak assumptions. OK. so. I told you all of this because what we are actually interested in is uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics. So if I take a non-equilibrium system, there are many ways of bringing it out of equilibrium. One possibility would be, for example, to warm up one side of the system, for example, the bottom here, and cool down the other side. So if we do that, we can imagine that there will be a flow of heat traveling through the system from the bottom to the top. So this will manifestly violate the assumptions of uh, thermodynamic equilibrium that I mentioned before. And uh, uh, this problem is way more complicated. 
So uh, the dynamics uh, that would uh, uh, be caused by this imbalance will be heavily system dependent. Heat flow is very, very different in solids or in liquids or in different kinds of liquids. And so there are no obvious uh, universal principles. So the state of the art here is uh, we know pretty much everything about equilibrium statistical physics. We know next to nothing about non-equilibrium systems. So what do we do? Uh, so one possibility uh, to study, to build up a theory on non-equilibrium statistical physics is to start from small systems. So here, one example would be like a relatively small particle in a fluid. So let's say this particle would be less than a micron. So it would be large respect to the molecules of the fluid, but still relatively small. So the advantage of studying this kind of system, we, we can also think about the non-equilibrium version of this problem would be like, for example, dragging this particle with a constant force. And this is the kind of logic that Einstein followed in his famous uh, paper on Brownian motion. So the advantage of studying this kind of system is that they are small, they have a few degrees of freedom, and so they are more tractable than large systems. The disadvantage is that the dynamics of a small system is stochastic because this particle is not very large compared to the molecules of the surrounding fluid. Each time that there is a collision, this particle will receive a kick in a random direction, and so its trajectory will be uh, characterized by a certain degree of randomness. Okay, so essentially, uh, and thanks Izumi for <laughs> introducing this, uh, the field of stochastic thermodynamics has been uh, a developing of this approach to non-equilibrium system. So the idea has been to uh, formulate uh, a consistent, complete, and coherent uh, thermodynamics uh, for systems that are small. So the idea, the general framework is that, again, you have a small system. This system is uh, embedded in an environment that is uh, uh, fixed at a, at a certain fixed uh, temperature. And this system is brought out of equilibrium by, for example, an external agent, can be an experimentalist, that could uh, perform work on the system or try to extract work from it. And examples of this can be colloidal particles, as we saw before, or for example, molecular motors. So these are molecules that consume chemical energy to perform work inside cells. So there are lots of also applications. And uh, this is the book that we recently wrote in which we try to provide uh, a uh, pedagogical introduction to this field. But so, um, I want to just give you a sense of the kind of results uh, that uh, people have been studying in uh, stochastic thermodynamics and why this is interesting. So if you take one of these uh, uh, small systems, there is a way of defining an entropy. So the entropy that the system produces during its dynamics. And since the trajectory of the system is random to some extent, so will be the trajectory of uh, the, the, the entropy production as a function of time. So on average, entropy will start from zero and go up because of the second law of thermodynamics. But because of this fluctuation, you can have uh, that uh, the fluctuations will bring uh, entropy production below zero, therefore creating these uh, apparent or transient violations of the second law of thermodynamics. So this, this, is, uh, this, this uh, phenomenon, this is, has been called uh, 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 transient violations of the second law of thermodynamics. The name is slightly misleading because uh, the second law of thermodynamics is formulated for large systems for which there are no fluctuations. So these phenomena are really absent in classical thermodynamics. But this is uh, what happens. So clearly there has been a lot of interest in characterizing how these fluctuations can create these, these effects. So, in general, the trajectory of entropy production is, as we say, this system dependent. Each uh, system will have its own dynamics. But there are some properties that are universal. For example, if you look at uh, the distribution of the minimum point of the entropy production along the trajectory, we found that this has a universal distribution, in fact. Uh, and in particular, uh, its average is minus 1 kb, so 1 in units of the Boltzmann constant. The maximum before the minimum also has a universal distribution. The number of times entropy production crosses this zero line also has a universal distribution, and so on. 
So here in these uh, curves I'm showing you um, lines are um, mathematical predictions from our theory and points are uh, simulations from three different kinds uh, of models of uh, small systems. So there, is, uh, there are some uh, um, properties that are universal even out of equilibrium if you look for them. Okay, so uh, this is a bit my introduction about physics, but uh, really what I wanted to tell you about today is about uh, relation between non-equilibrium physics and biological systems. So this is a, a long-standing question, and uh, the, I believe that one of the problems in biological physics is uh, of historical nature. So physics uh, traditionally has been built upon describing inanimate matter, and it uh, took us a lot of time before really being brave enough to uh, uh, think about uh, what to do for biological systems. And it shouldn't be a surprise that the first things, the first uh, systems that uh, biophysics studied were things like proteins and membranes, for example. This is really the fabric of living systems. But you might think that if I want to study a protein, it doesn't really matter that this is part of a living system. This is ultimately a large molecule, and I can study it with the same tools that we can use to study inanimate molecules, at least from a physics point of view. And so I will argue that there is a much larger jump in going from this type of uh, biophysics to a biophysics of things that uh, are really alive, they can grow, they can replicate, they can sense their environment and take decision about the state of the environment and so on. So this is, thinking of a physics of the system is a, is a much more challenging task. Um, I would also ask, uh, argue that this is a task that is wor worth thinking about. I'm not the first arguing for that. So for example, one uh, um, very famous example is this very nice book by Erwin Schrodinger that already in the 40s started thinking about a physics of life. This is not the original edition, but you really can't be discover, I think. And uh, the line of reasoning of Schrodinger is really heavily based on uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics. In fact, perhaps the most famous quote from this book is this uh, life feeds on negative entropy, which is a quite profound concept, I would say is expressed in a slightly obscure way. So I think what uh, Schrodinger wanted to say here is that uh, in order to function, cells need to create some kind of order structure inside them. The natural tendency, because of temperature, would, have to, would be to have disorder inside cells. And so this, there should be some non-equilibrium mechanism that dumps the entropy corresponding to this disorder and throws it into the environment. So this is essentially what, what Schrodinger w wanted to say here. Uh, because of uh, the room we are in today, I want uh, to uh, tell you of another quote that I discovered only recently, in fact, just a few weeks ago. So this is uh, in this uh, nice uh, opinion paper in Nature uh, 10 years ago uh, called the Life Code Script. I believe 2012 was 100 years since the birth of uh, Alan Turing, and Nature made uh, these special opinion pieces about contributions of Turing to various fields of science, and uh, Sidney Brenner wrote one about contributions of Turing to biology. And this is, uh, is uh, what, what he wrote. This is an extract from this uh, article. So he starts by saying, biological research is in a crisis. So he really didn't sugarcoat it, and this is really the first paragraph of his article. He just, he didn't mention Turing at all. He just said, biological research is in a crisis. We are drowning in a sea of data and thirsting from some theoretical framework with which to understand it. Although many believe that more is better, history tells us that least is best. We need theory and a firm grasp on the nature of the objects we study to predict the rest. It's very nice. Then at some point he, he talks about Turing, but no, not in the very beginning. Okay, so I started thinking uh, about these kind of problems before uh, joining OIST. Uh, and uh, in particular, I, I looked at the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of uh, replication of information. So this is a basic task that all cells need to do. Uh, information in cells is uh, contained in heteropolymers like DNA, and there are enzymes that are responsible of uh, 
reliably copying this information. So from the very like, first principle point of view, ideally you would like these machines to copy this information with a very high accuracy because you want faithful replication of information. You, you don't want to spend too much energy to do so because energy is precious in cells. And you also like to do it at high speed because these molecules are very long and if you take too much time that might impact your fitness. If this process was carried out at thermodynamic equilibrium or close to it, you would have very low accuracy, again because temperature in equilibrium systems tend to create noise and prevents any kind of order structure. You would have no dissipation, so this would be good. And also you would have a vanishing speed because uh, equilibrium systems are pretty much static. So from this kind of argument uh, you can think that these machines clearly operate out of equilibrium and what they really do is uh, they have to trade off the energy they spend to improve their accuracy and uh, improve their speed. And so there are lots of interesting questions about the trade-offs uh, involved in this business. So how much dissipation goes into improving accuracy versus improving speed, and what are the trade-offs between accuracy and speed themselves, right? The other question is how do we study all of this experimentally? Because coming here at TOIS, I was also interested not in doing abstract theory, but thinking how to measure this thing in a lab. And so one thing that uh, we started thinking about is that uh, we can uh, uh, exploit uh, statistical properties of growing population. So we know in general from uh, microbiological studies, if you give uh, plenty of nutrients to a microbial population, after an initial lag time, the population will grow exponentially, and then there will be a stationary phase in which the resources are finished and the population will stop grow, and eventually there might be a death phase. So in the exponential po uh, phase, the number of cells grows like exponential of time with some exponential growth rate. And uh, so one point that I want to mention here is that if you imagine to have a diverse populations where individuals carry a differ some different property that might be a function of their age, then what you find, and this was fine first in this very nice paper by Powell, and then there's a long literature of variants of this, and we also contributed to this problem, is that the average of this trait over the uh, growing population uh, is the average of this uh, distribution weighted uh, by the exponential of minus the growth rate times the age. So this is pretty nice because this looks pretty similar to equilibrium statistical physics. So I can interpret age as energy and lambda as an inverse temperature and so this looks really like the kind of averages we do over the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and we are used to do since 200 years. So that's pretty nice because this is a, a manifestly non-equilibrium system. It couldn't be farther from equilibrium, but I, I can have expressions that transform it into something that looks like an equilibrium system. Um, again, this might sound a bit abstract, but let me um, tell you an, the application that we worked on. And this uh, is a um, replication of uh, DNA in a bacteria. Again, let me give you some basics. So in most bacteria, uh, most bacteria have a circular uh, single chromosome. This will be their genome. And DNA is copied by two large uh, uh, protein complexes called replisomes. They will bind uh, at a specific site called the origin of replication, proceed in opposite direction, and so they will meet at the end, and at the point you will have two copies of the DNA. Um, so what caught our attention here is that uh, this is something uh, present in previous studies. If you sequence an exponentially growing population and look at the amount of DNA you find as a function of the genome position, you find this characteristic pattern with a peak at the origin of replication and a minimum at the final region where the replication finishes. And the reason is that in an ex exponentially growing population, there will be a lot of uh, incomplete genomes that are undergoing synthesis. These genomes will always contain the origin, but they will have a, a decreasing probability of containing regions that are far from the origin of replication. So these are uh, problem where we really can apply directly our theory. So here 
we have our distribution, so this will be the genome coordinate, this will be the age of the genome since it starts being replicated, and so this will be essentially the probability that a genome uh, of age tau will contain the position x. And so essentially by averaging this function, as I showed you before, we can predict this curve, which means we can infer the dynamics of these replisomes starting from experimental data. So I will not go into details, um, but uh, again, we could apply this theory thanks uh, to our collaborators from the Yokobayashi unit that uh, performed uh, experiments where we sequenced the uh, uh, growing populations of E. coli at different temperatures. So here the points are experimental data, the lines are our model prediction. And what we found is uh, there is a, a variable speed of uh, genome replication. So the, the average speed uh, increases with temperature. This is something to be expected because temperature tends to speed up molecular reactions. But what was more surprising about this is that uh, the velocity of these machines is not constant along the genome, but displays uh, regular and repeatable oscillations. So in this plot, again, in the center, is the origin of replication, and these are the variation of the velocity of these machines. And you can see here uh, this wave-like pattern with variation on the order of 15%, and this is highly repeatable. This, these oscillations are only absent at the lowest temperature we studied. So this was quite interesting for us, and we tried to think, what does it mean? Is this a real thing? Is this an artifact of our model? And what we found is that previously, people have measured the variations of the mutation rate of E. coli along its genome. And what they found is uh, something that is very similar to what we study. So again, here, these are velocity as a function of position. And this is a mutation rate. So if you look at how many accumulated mutations you have as a function of the position, you see a very similar pattern. So there is a very high degree of correlation between these two things. So this is quite exciting for us for a number of reasons. One is uh, related with what I told you at the beginning of this part uh, about the trade-offs between speed and accuracy of this machine. So our interpretation here is that for some reason there are some areas of the genome where this machine progress at a faster speed. And as a consequence, because there should be a trade-off between speed and accuracy, when they're going faster, they make more mistakes. And so as a consequence, the observed mutation rate is also higher. So again, this is something that we plan to uh, study more in the future. Um, OK, so I showed you this is an example where growth can help us uh, saying something uh, unexpected about a system at small scale inside cell. But of course, growth has a lot of consequences for larger systems, in particular for uh, population of uh, cells. So um, I will tell you a bit about this uh, recent project uh, of a student in our group, Anzelica, that we also did in collaboration with the Shen Lab. Uh, so the experiment is, uh, consists of uh, uh, looking at competition between two strains of uh, E. coli. These two strains are uh, tagged with a different fluorescent protein that makes them look uh, one red and one green under the fluorescent microsome, uh, microscope but they are otherwise identical. So we inoculated these strains in a microchannel and we looked at their competition dynamics. Uh, so this is the movie I'm showing you now. So in the beginning, these two strains are well mixed. They can reproduce and reproduction make them expel from the channel. And what you see is that uh, in a few generation, we observe this uh, very regular pattern of uh, alternating lane of green and red bacteria in the channel. And at some point, at even longer time, this pattern gets disrupted. So the idea of this experiment came from uh, uh, theory. So we actually studied a model of how these dynamics uh, could uh, go about. So in the model, uh, individuals are placed for simplicity on a lattice. So we have uh, lines of uh, n cells, and you have m lines. And uh, each cell. Uh, Cells can be, uh, become to different types of strains that here are represented by different colors. And every time a cell reproduces, it will place a daughter cell in one of the neighboring positions and push an entire lane of cell, leading to an expulsion of another cell from the channel. 
So if you simulate this model starting from this infinitely diverse initial state, you will see that after a few generation, the model predicts formation of stripes, in this case only two stripes, uh, and uh, at a very long time there will be competition between these stripes and, uh, and finally one species will dominate. So we try to analyze it uh, mathematically, these simulations, and essentially the idea is that we could uh, solve exactly the case where the channel is so narrow that there is a single lane. And in this case, our mathematical theory tells us that uh, the fixation process, so the process by which one of the types dominates the channel, is extremely fast. So this is a very fast process. And so the idea was, well, probably this means that if you have many channels, then uh, since this dynamics is fast, in a short time, each of the lane will be dominated by one species, and then you will start to have competition among these lanes that we can also, at this point, uh, describe because each lane counts as an individual unit, and this will lead to a final fixation uh, inside the channel. So, um, again, because of, uh, we wanted to test this, so um, um, uh, Amy and Paul in, uh, in the Shen unit uh, constructed these microfluidic devices uh, with the channels of different width hosting from one to four lanes of bacteria. And by tracking uh, the bacterial dynamics, we were able to test our predictions. And so, um, essentially, uh, this is uh, the number of types that we observed in this first uh, regime of fast dynamics, and this is the dynamics in the second regime. And in these plots, the lines are our mathematical exact, uh, approximated but mathematical results. The triangles are uh, numerical simulations, and the circles are uh, the experiments. So not only we can qualitatively describe uh, these competition dynamics, but uh, we, we can be very quantitative about what happens and the dynamics in these systems. Okay, so let me uh, finish, I will uh, conclude. Um, so I hope I convince you that there are many interesting open problems in biological physics uh, and uh, we, can, uh, we have a hope to find uh, interesting general principles and simplicity in biology if we look for these principles. And uh, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging uh, lots of people. I think here I would have needed the rolling credits, like in the movies. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, my unit. Without uh, them, this would not have been possible. So this is a relatively old uh, photo. There should have been a surprise photo by Scotty, but I don't know what happened with that. Um, so Deepak and Floriana have been working on the Replison project that I showed you before, and Angelica worked on this microchannel competition uh, uh, project. There are many collaborators. I've worked mostly with the external collaborators for this stochastic thermodynamic uh, work. Um, Samuel and Yohei for the Yokobayashi unit, and Charles from the LASCOM unit for the Replison project, Amy and Paul for the experiments uh, bacteria and microchannels, and all my other uh, uh, collaborators at OIST, Bourguignon Unit, Kusum Unit, Laurino Reiter, and probably I forgot somebody, I apologize in advance. And thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, like to take questions from the audience, if you have any. Yep. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I have a very specific question regarding the uh, fluid from the replisome project that we can see. It's basically the waves that it derived is quite um, symmetrical. And you were also mentioning that there could be an underlying biological, um, you know, underlying principle for all the waves or all the dynamics of the fluidics in terms of populational growth. And I also read the eLife um, paper real quick to see like the underlying logic of it. So I, so do you know about sonification? So we use sonicate, we use sonicators to 
as biologists to, to really mix up and to break up our, um, and to basically to make our solutions or make some organic solvents evenly distributed. And it is very commonly used, for example, if we want to make um, lipo liposomes. And it is a very difficult technology for separating liposomes because even when you were you know, shaking and sonicating the, those fats and trying to make them into balls, into this solution, you make big balls and you make small balls and it's very difficult to make them evenly distributed. Um, do you have any insights for that kind of like, because in term, because when we talk about those kind of underlying fluidics and waves and then in terms of biological, and now think about actual technical, those waves and distributions like the sonicators, would you have any insights to offer for that kind of, for our biologists when we make experiment, when we do experiments to make our solutions and make those, you know, organic and fatty solutions to make that very evenly distributed for, you know, the underlying biological va waves. Uh, thanks. I'm not sure I understood the, the entire question. So one, one thing I can say is uh, uh, in the model we assumed that uh, the waves are symmetric. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can see from the figure, but the co experimental curves look pretty symmetric as well. Maybe there are some points where there's a slight lack of symmetry, but we don't, didn't want to introduce too many parameters. Uh, I mean, we believe uh, that this is real. This is not due to um, the experimental uh, uh, method used. So we use sonication as well to break the DNA. Of course, it would be nice to try different things, but uh, um, since the population is not synchronized, it would be unlikely that this depends on uh, anything of the experimental protocol. But of course, there are lots of things that we could check and maybe we can talk no, separately. No, no, I, I was just using this like as an example because basically this is like growth, right? You were like unzipping the double-stranded DNA and replisome making them. And, but for sonication and also like waves in the brain, sometimes it's like you do this kind of waves, but then for biological, f for, for those fluids, it's, like that kind of spatial distribution and then the product you make is relatively, I was just wondering in terms of mathematics and the sum, and, and then you kind of physics, if there's any insights in terms of the equations for the kind of sonications. I'm not sure, but maybe we can talk separately. Okay, <laughs> yes, sure, thank you. Ooh. I'll rest. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Simone, for this interesting talk. Um, I have a simple physics question. In the beginning, when you talked about negative entropy, this is the first time I heard about that. Uh, normally, entropy is a measure of disorder. And, uh, and bringing entropy down means making order. And I can't imagine something neg neg negative order. So uh, am I misunderstanding the concept of entropy? Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't uh, spend too much time uh, formally defining everything, so <laughs> it's uh, justified. So, essentially, what, what uh, we here call entropy has two parts. So one is uh, the change in system entropy. So there will be an entropy of the system in the beginning, and this would have a variation. And the second is uh, essentially the heat released in the thermal bath divided by the temperature. So it will be what one called uh, the reservoir entropy in thermodynamics book or general the environment entropy. Um, so this will be the sum of the two. So it's the to total entropy produced in the process. And, uh, and it's this, the sum that in the second law dictates that the sum must be positive. But you can have fluctuations affecting both. So essentially the idea is uh, how can I uh, so imagine that you have a, the simplest case is a, you have a particle, like a colloidal particle, and you are dragging it with a certain force, right? So if the force is, a, if the force is large, you know that essentially, and we are in a viscous medium, all the work I'm doing is dissipated into the fluid. But if the force is not so large and the particle is small, it is possible that the particle will move in this direction 
instead of this direction. So if this happens, I am extracting work from the particle because the particle is pulling me, right? So if this happens, this, since the particle has no internal entropy, this, all the entropy is the entropy released in a thermal bath, here effectively I am sucking entropy from the thermal bath and transforming it into work. Of course this can happen only because of fluctuations, so on average the particle will move in the direction in which I am pulling it, but even for the simple system you can have, it, the particle will only move to the right on average, right? Would that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That, mean, that means on average you don't have negative entropy, but... On average you don't, yeah. If you average out, these things disappear. Thanks. Other questions? Because if not, I have one question um, for Simone. So, uh, actually, it's re relating to the speed accuracy trade off that you showed in Replosome. Do you think that it, there is some advantage to having such a system? In other words, are these um, high um, mutating parts um, there for some reason? Is there some advantage for? Um, these genetic materials to have mutations and, uh, you know, very close to the origin, for example? Uh, that's um, a great question. Um, it's a very good question. I am not sure. I'm not sure if these variations are, are so large to be selected for. So I would imagine that uh, you would uh, want to place say, for example, highly conserved region. This doesn't, oh, this one, sorry, take the wrong one. Highly conserved genes close to the minima of this. You don't want to have uh, too many mutations. Uh, we are planning to look at the E. coli genome and see whether there's some correlation between uh, um, position of important essential genes and, and this pattern, but we, we really didn't study that. That's, that's a good idea. Anything else? Okay, then we'll continue the tradition. Uh, we have a gift plaque that uh, the provost office kindly prepared. Um, so it looks like this, and it has a haiku on it. <laughs> so congratulations, Simone. And we have another s sort of a surprise that um, his lab members have also prepared a little something for Simone. So would you like to come to the front, um, Simone's lab members? Every occasion needs cake. Thanks. I don't know where it is. Wow. Thanks. So this plaque is the result of a vote. Um, to be fair, the vote was taken within only our group, so... <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. But still a vote, so... That's great, it's from show. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Should, should we do candles or... Like, maybe we can go outside and... Yeah, exactly. No, we can go outside. We want to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, no, Thank you. no food in the auditorium. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Great. Well, this concludes this previous lecture, but there'll be a refreshment outside, so please